So you can watch us on YouTube. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, it's, I mean, it's a great illustration, isn't it? Because we rely on the power. And when the power's cut, then everything stops working. Uh, and I guess that's the message uh, of the, uh, the sermon uh, this morning, is that when God lifts his righteous right hand, then power leaves. And what are we left with? We're left with darkness. And that's really where we're going uh, this morning as we pick up the second part of chapter 13 uh, in the book of Isaiah. So reading from verse 13 of chapter 13. It says, Therefore I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will shake from its place at the wrath of the Lord Almighty in the day of his burning anger. Like a hunted gazelle, like sheep without a shepherd, they will all turn to their own people. They will flee in their native land. Whoever is captured will be thrust through. All who are caught will fall by the sword. Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be looted and their wives violated. See, I will stir up against them the Medes who do not care for silver and have no delight in gold. Their bows will strike down the young men, and they will have no mercy on infants, nor will they look with compassion on children. Babylon, the jewel of kingdoms, the pride and glory of the Babylonians, will be overthrown by God like Sodom and Gomorrah. She will never be inhabited or live in through all generations, or be lived in through all generations. There, no nomads will pitch their tents. There no shepherds will rest their flocks, but desert creatures will lie there. Jackals will fill her houses. There the owls will dwell, and there the wild goats will leap about. Hyenas will inhabit her strongholds, jackals her luxurious palaces. Her time is at hand, and her days will not be prolonged. This is God's word. And Lord, we just ask the Lord to help us as we unpack this uh, to see how it reflects on us this day. How do you respond to the sin that destroys humanity? Uh, Alexander was just sharing with the, the kids this morning the devastation of what sin did and what sin does. Sin separates us from God. Sin puts a gulf between us and God. God is a holy God, and because of his holiness, sinful beings cannot be in his presence. There has to be that gulf, that separation, and sin separates us from holy God. But sin is so divisive in that it causes problems within our own relationships. Sin causes us to separate. Sin affects us internally and externally. Just think back at the last argument you had with your wife and what was at the root of it. She was wrong. Sorry. <laughs> Just, that was just an illustration of how sinful I am. There you, go. <laughs> you seem surprised. I surprised. No, you didn't seem surprised. <laughs> you didn't seem surprised at all. <laughs> See, sin destroys humanity. And what we're going to look in this passage is the devastating effect that sin has as God brings judgment but separates himself uh, from the people. It's the beginning of the end. This is the beginning of the end. But the question this morning is when we realize that we're in the end times, that God is going to bring judgment upon this world. He's very patient, he's long suffering. He allows a lot to go by, but he is going to bring judgment. Judgment day is coming. How do we know that? Because the Bible tells us that judgment day is coming. And the question this morning is, 
Are we ready? Are we ready? Are we taking this seriously? I don't know if any of you watched last Sunday evening uh, the program that was on BBC about Israel and Gaza. 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 Is it Gaza or Gaza? Gaza. Gaza's the footballer, isn't it? Yeah. So the darkest days, it was called. The darkest days, Israel, Gaza, six months on. Did anybody watch it? You watched it, yeah? Because you were with me. (laughs) What I would recommend you do is catch up on it. It's BBC. Go to iPlayer. It's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. And they warn you, they gave you a, a disclaimer at the beginning of it that this program will be really, it will, it will be really bad. The pain and the suffering. And they looked at it from both sides. They looked at it from uh, Hamas going into Israel and murdering people, raping w- uh, women, uh, children. And it was just indiscriminate. They were going around, they, uh, they were all hiding in a bus shelter and the, uh, the Hamas came up and they threw grenades into the bus shelter. The guy had his leg blown up, off and he hid, had to hide under bodies as they went in to shoot them. And then on the other side where Israel is destroying Gaza and, and women and children are being uh, destroyed on that side uh, of the, the fight and the war. And, and the reason I bring this to you is because it struck me this is man without God. This is man without God. And the violation and the defilement is horrendous. And it's just a shadow of what's to come when Christ is lifted and God lifts his righteous right hand uh, from the earth. And it says here, at uh, uh, verse 13, it says, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken. You know, do we really believe that God is in control of the universe? And when we consider the depths of our sin, then this passage gives us an indication of its magnitude. Our finite human sin will one day have cosmic implications. And that's how catastrophic human sin is. We we scratch the surface of sin. We think it's just things that we do wrong. You know, if if we'd asked the, the kids this morning, what is sin? They would say it's, when I disobey mom and dad, or it's, I, I disobey or, uh, or I do things, or when I mess up, that's, that's sin. And that's, I guess that's, in a way, that's what we think about sin as well. You know, uh, we can do more good things than bad things, and therefore we can do well. Uh, if we do more good than bad, then we're, we're doing okay. That's a misunderstanding of sin. That's a misunderstanding of who we are. Sin goes really deep within us. In fact, we are sinners right at our very core. So whenever we, dis, uh, whenever we disobey God's word, whenever we uh, are not ruled by uh, Jesus, then uh, sin is at the heart of it. Even the good things that we do uh, can be sinful because our motives um, and our attitudes can be wrong. Our finite human sin will one day have cosmic implications. Cosmic implications. It will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken. Well, think about that the next time you're considering carrying out some willful sin. This is the day of the Lord, the day of his burning anger. We're going to look at three points this morning. The day of mercy is past. 
the day of the brutality of war and the day the mighty fall. And I just want to read from uh, the book of Revelation. John records that the heavens tremble and the earth shake in Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind. And the sky was split apart like a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men of the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Jesus is going to judge. And it's not Jesus meek and mild. It's not baby Jesus. It's not the suffering servant. This is the avenging king. This is the all-powerful Jesus who is coming back to judge. And what we see in verses 14 to 18 of this passage is that it focuses on the savagery that will be revealed in a world that rejected God and now is experiencing his his day of wrath. Jesus said uh, on uh, the Mount of Olives, he said, because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. And then the end will come. Jesus says, love will grow cold. Love will grow cold. It's a frightening thing. Doesn't that send a chill? Well, if it has, maybe your love's growing cold. (laughs) If your love is growing cold, what keeps us going? What keeps our relationships going? You know, I love you guys. That's why I come here. (laughs) Did you say we don't? No. That's, oh, that warms your cockles, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, love will grow cold. That is a frightening thing. That is a frightening thing. Not to have love for someone. Not to care about someone. To be so self-centered that it's all about you and not about anybody else at all. You don't give that for anyone. Love grows cold. What did he say? Was it the church at Ephesus? It says you've lost your first love. Yeah, and Jesus wrote uh, seven letters to seven churches in the book of Revelation. And he says to the church at Ephesus, I have one thing against you. You have lost your first love. Could I ask you this morning? What's your love life like with the Lord Jesus Christ? Steady. (laughs) What's your love life like with the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you lost your first love? Can you remember when you got saved and that excitement of coming to know Jesus Christ? It was exciting. It still is exciting, but the the zeal, you know, when you first, when you first meet, you know, when you, you first met Hugh, and that excitement, <laughs> of those palpitations. Uh, we'll not go there. <laughs> when love grows cold. But it's true, isn't it? Because when when you're young and uh, you know, love is exciting and 
And uh, that's, you know, I was, I was saying the same, I think I probably said the same to you. It's interesting when, one of the, there's two things that interest me when I go and visit families about funerals is uh, when they met their spouse and the story around that. Because there's usually a good story around when you meet your spouse. You're smiling, right? You can share that with us then. <laughs> and, so, and so, and the other thing is about humor. I love to know people's humor. And that's why we spent, what, three hours laughing. Uh, talk, <laughs> I forgot to talk about your mom <laughs> uh, all that time. Um, but you know what it does is it tells us that there is a love story in our lives. There's a love story f- that we have But our love story comes when we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal savior. Is she snoring? (laughs) Meredith snoring, so just, (laughs) it's not Nicole, it's Meredith. She's having a wee wee snore at the back. I know, I can't really wake her up, can I? That would just be mean. (laughs) I'll wake you up if you fall asleep though. But love will grow cold, frightening, and then the end will come. So before the end comes, love starts to grow cold. There was no love shown between these guys who broke into Israel and went to that festival. There was no love shown there. They just slaughtered people. They shot people indiscriminately. They dragged people out of their cars. They set the cars on fire with people. It was horrendous. And there's no love shown by Israel to the people of Gaza because they're just indiscriminately bombing them. And they're starving them out now. There is no love grows cold. This is a foreshadowing of a bigger thing coming. But are we ready for this? Isaiah uses this simile like a hunted gazelle, like sheep with no one to gather them in. He's giving a picture of unbelievers, the sheep without a shepherd, the sheep without the good shepherd. They will be easily dispersed and lost, lost for eternity in the day of the Lord. They're like animals that have been spooked. The inhabitants of this great city, Babylon, and Babylon's just a picture of the whole world will be in full flight to avoid the onslaught. So when love grows cold and humanity ceases and everybody's in it for themselves and evil just rules and it's just horrendous, then they're gonna scatter. If you watch that program, what happened was they heard a few Uh, bombs going off, uh, missiles that are being chucked over. And they're used to that in Israel because they they have a defense system that takes the missiles out. Um, But then they heard gunfire. Then there was these people starting to, uh, uh, all kitted up in army gear, um, and they were shooting at people, and they scattered. They started to run. And I don't know how many thousand were at the festival, but they started to run over the fields. They just tried to find how they scattered. And that's what you find, you know, if you've got a flock of sheep in a field and a dog gets in, the sheep will scatter. They run. They'll run into brick walls or stone walls. They don't, they're just trying to get away. And that's what this simile is showing us. It's when the day of the Lord, when this lost eternity starts, This, we react like spooked animals trying to get away when the onslaught is coming. They realize that whatever their faith was in, nothing but Jesus would be an impenetrable fortress. No one but Jesus can save. But they seek refuge with their own people. What are you turning to when things get tough? Where do you go to find refuge? Just, just reflect back, because we've all been through tough times. We've all had difficult times. Where do you go when the going gets tough? 
Do you go to family? Do you go to friends? Do you look how much is in the bank account to make sure that you've got enough money to get through? Do you go to the authorities and ask for help from the authorities? When things get really, really tough, where do you go? Where is your first port of call? Well, we know, don't we? We know, because if, if, we if we went round the room just now, where would you put your trust, Isabel? Where would you put your trust? God. God. And you see, that's it, the God card. That's good. But you know, what I want you to really think, we all know that that's the answer. It's like when you ask the kids questions, it's either Jesus or God, and you, you've got to be right, haven't you? <laughs> it's, you've got to be pretty good, certain that you're going to get the question right if you say Jesus or God. And we do know that, and that is the right answer. But really what we've got to think is, is that what we actually do in practice when things get tough? Do we try and sort it ourselves first? Do we try and get to the root of the problem? Do we have enough energy and strength and wisdom to try and solve the problem ourselves and only when we try all those things we go whoops maybe I should have gone to God with it maybe I should have put my trust in God yeah and that's something we need to be honest with ourselves about because we all know the answer we all know the answer but is, how are we actually working that out in verse 14 we find that there is no protection. It's the sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd, there is no protection. If a dog or a wolf gets into the flock, it's just going to annihilate the flock. It needs a shepherd for the protection. So there is going to be no protection. There will be no escape. They're going to fall by the sword. And there'll be no mercy. Wives, children possessions all defiled there was no mercy i wish you'd seen that program but it's horrendous so i don't want you to watch it really but but i do want you to watch it and and it was a good title for it the darkest days the darkest days it was black because there was no mercy shown it wasn't about people there was there was no quarter given they didn't look at a young girl and think it was a young girl who had a life in front of her. They would just shoot her. No quarter given. No mercy shown. You see, they've got everything to, uh, to escape from, to flee from, but nowhere to flee to. Humankind without God is without safety and without a home. It's horrendous. Whoever is captured will be thrust through. All who are caught will fall by the sword. We don't like to think of these things because it's so evil. It's so unjust. It's, it's so painful. It's inhumane. And there's going to be a massacre on the day of the Lord. And it's not going to be a day of mercy. The day of mercy has passed. And all that remains for those who have rejected God's long suffering and patience is his judgmental wrath. I hope you're hearing these words this morning. And grasp what God is offering to us this morning. If you're not a born again believer, then consider and hear that his grace is available right now. Is he calling you? Will you respond? We have a choice. We know that God saves and God's grace pours out on those that do not deserve it but because he loves us 
And when God's grace is poured out on us, we recognize that we fall short of the glory of God and we need to make a decision. We need to make that decision to commit our lives to following him. And he gives us the faith to believe with all our heart to do that. God's grace is available today, but it's not always going to be available. When he removes his righteous right hand from this earth, you've missed out. It's gone. There's no way to receive it. And therefore, these words are a word of warning. They're a word of warning to us today that you need to know that you're in Christ, that Christ has forgiven you your sins, that you have a relationship by faith in Jesus Christ, that it's a living relationship. It's a loving relationship. It's a relationship that is rooted and grounded in the Savior himself. It's not a knowledge of those things. I often think, you know, we teach the kids salvation. We teach the kids the word of God and and to be saved. And then we ask them, do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? I'll guarantee you what the answer is going to be. Yeah, we love the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Yeah, I can explain to you exactly what salvation is. But knowing it doesn't save you. It's only Jesus who can save you. Do you know that? Do you know that personal relationship? And now this is one of the hardest things to explain. How can I explain to you the relationship that I have with him if you haven't got that relationship? It's just words. It's really difficult, isn't it? Until you've experienced it, then all you've got is knowledge. And so you need the Lord Jesus Christ to reach into your heart for you to be born again. What did he say to Nicodemus? You must be born again. And Nicodemus goes, how? I'm a grown man. Uh, I'm a rabbi. I'm the top of my game. You know, what? yeah, my mom's going to be really pleased you know, I'm six foot two. No, he was a Jew, so he was probably a bit lower than that. But I mean, he was, so he was, he was, he was anyway, he was a big guy. And his mom's going to go, oh, no, 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 no. But he wasn't. He says, you need to be born of the Spirit. Born again. Well, I've been born. You've been born physically, but you need to be born again of the Spirit. It's when the Spirit of God enlivens you and makes you alive to him. It's then that when you read the Bible, it suddenly means something to you. When you start to open up the word of God, he's speaking to you. And boy, you've just found yourself in the actual word of God. It's me. It's about me. Well, no, it's all about Jesus, really. It's not about me. It's all about Jesus. But we're in here, and he speaks to us through it. You know, one of the most exciting things as a Christian is when you read the word of God and God speaks to you personally about something that's in your head that nobody else knows about and he brings the word of God right into you. Isn't that exciting? That just sort of blows you away and you go, that's amazing. But it shouldn't be amazing, should it? That should be a daily bread to live by that. The day of the brutality of war Their little ones also will be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses will be plundered and their wives ravished. Dashed, plundered, ravished. Adjectives that describe the horrors in this dreadful day of the Lord. This so-called civilized nations are barbarians. Their hearts have never been circumcised by grace through faith in Christ. It's horrendous. 
And he says, behold, I'm stirring up the Medes against them who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Here we see God is active in history. He's not way off there, out in the distance, passive. He's not just a spectator over these things. He's in complete charge. He's sovereign over his plan. All his actions are purposeful. No event happens by chance. Yes, folks, all that uh, atrocity that's happening in Gaza, all the atrocity that happened in Israel, it's part of God's plan. And you think, really? Really? It's the sinfulness of man. It's not God doing that. Man is responsible for what they do, and they will pay the consequences of that when the day of judgment comes. We've looked in the past about tiglath Pileser. Pileser. He was the king of the Assyrians. Great name, isn't it? Tiglath. I'd suggested we called one of our children Tiglath, but uh, it wasn't voted for. <laughs> so we ended up with Alexander instead. <laughs> tiglath Pileser. Lovely name. He was stirred up by the Lord against Israel and Judah. And God stirred up the Babylonians against Jerusalem. And God stirred up the Medes against Babylon. And the Lord who stirred up Cyrus to allow the Jews exile, Jewish exile to return to Judah. Who in return urged the exiles to come back under Zerubbabel, I think it was. The Lord stirred up Zerubbabel. And Joshua, through the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, to carry the construction of the second temple to its completion. Is God stirring you up this morning? Do you feel stirred up this morning? Do you hear him speaking to you? Do you feel that pressure of the Holy Spirit upon your soul as you hear the words of God being spoken? Is he stirring something within you that's how the Holy Spirit works I remember years ago being in Dedridge Baptist Church and they did an altar call and I had no idea but I ended up at the front I was stirred up and moved to walk down to the front and then an elder came to me after the service and said, why did you come down the front? I said, oh, <laughs> I was stirred up. No, I didn't say I was stirred up. The Holy Spirit moved me to come down to the front and they prayed over me. This was before I got saved. But I was stirred up. Something moved me. You were stirred up that day. He was sitting approximately where you are, William, and there was an altar call. And, and he didn't want to come forward. He was resisting. He was resisting. And he's having this battle with God. Sitting in the pew. Nobody else could see it. And he's, he's battling with God. Saying, I don't want to go up. I'm not going to go up. And the Holy Spirit's saying, walk, boy, walk. And Tina was praying behind him. Alexander, go up. You're going up. And then he suddenly, next thing he finds, is on his knees on that uh, step there. Because he was stirred up by the Holy Spirit stirred up by the Holy Spirit are you being stirred up by the Holy Spirit this morning it's exciting and it proves your salvation if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you is he calling you is he calling you right now you see the Lord is no puppet master making them do what he wants People are simply being themselves. And he uses our character and our gifts to bring about his purposes. In Isaiah 14, 26, note the guiding power in history is the stretching out of his hand. This day is the withdrawing of his hand as he judgmentally leaves sinners unrestrained to implement all the savagery of their fallen nature. It's, it's like in Romans 1 where he says, I gave them over to the desires. See, if, if, if you desire something more than God, 
you know, if you've got God in second, third, fourth, fifth, tenth place in the list, if you've got other things that you want to do uh, above God, God will only persevere with you for a time before he says, you want that more than me, so you can have it. But you're not going to get me. And he gives them over to the desires of the flesh. Folks, that is the most frightening thing that can happen to us. When God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh had no way back. Pharaoh hardened his own heart first. Remember that? Pharaoh hardened his own heart. But when God hardened Pharaoh's heart, he was done. When we play with sin, and we think we can get away with that, it's a very dangerous place to be. It's very dangerous. God is patient. God is long-suffering. And we think we can get away with that because we haven't been judged. But see when God says, enough is enough. You want that more than me. I'll give you over to it. He's removed his righteous right hand and then we pay the consequences of that there's no way back at that point so the, the the warning this morning is if you're knowingly sinning i'm not particularly looking at you <laughs> if you're <laughs> if you're knowingly it's just that you confessed something to me the other day so that's what i was looking at <laughs> if you're knowingly sinning be very careful. Take it really, really seriously. You need to examine yourself almost on a, on a daily basis. You know, examine yourself in the morning, examine yourself at night and reflect on what's gone through the day. And if there's sin present, then deal with it. Repent of it. Turn from it. Turn back to Jesus. Don't bury it. Don't hide it. Because when God says, you love that, the thing you've been hiding away, that wee thing you've been squirreling away, the thing that you don't think anybody else knows about, because you've got it nicely hidden. God knows. And he says, you want that more than me. Because you're not hiding me in your heart, you're hiding this thing in your heart. You fill in the blank. What is the this thing? Be careful. Be very careful. The more people turn their backs on God, the more they are determined to be themselves. The less humanity they have, therefore less humane. The day's coming. Sin will take center stage like the, the, the likes of we've never seen before, we've never experienced before. It will be total and savage. And those who did not want, to God, get, want God will get what they wanted. They will be given up to themselves. He paints this vivid picture of the savagery of the armies in the future day of the Lord. We saw that uh, when the Medes conquered the Babylonians in 539 BC. They got no concern for young men. They got no restraint or pity over the infants. Uh, and they didn't think of the future because they just destroyed the children. They just wanted to fulfill their own desires. And then you've got this, the Babylon, the beautiful kingdom, the glory of the Chaldeans. Pride will be as God overthrows Sodom and Gomorrah. You notice how, how beautiful it was, how beautiful Babylon was. It was one of the most beautiful cities in the whole world. The hanging gardens of Babylon, one of the seven wonders of the world. It would just take your breath away. And God says it'll be like Sodom and Gomorrah, completely erased. It's under the Dead Sea, isn't it, Sodom and Gomorrah? Is it under the Dead Sea? The Red Sea. The Dead Sea. It's the Dead Sea. Yeah. They believe that. They believe that, yeah. You see, God allows a brief day in the sun, but then an eternity in the darkness. Gosh, look what time it is. You can't pay lip service to sin. Sin will come. 
we know that God says what he means and he means what he says. You see, these prophecies over Babylon have to come to fulfillment. Babylon needs to be rebuilt in order for it to be destroyed, that there will be no inhabitants in this place evermore. It'll be completely destroyed, almost like a nuclear hit on it. And we know that it will happen because if it doesn't happen, then the words of Isaiah are not true. God's word can't be true if it's not going to happen. So it will happen. It's a future thing that is going to come about. It will be desolate. It will be destroyed. And it will only be a place of hyenas and owls and demonic powers that will be in the place. And so what is today about? Well, it's to have a fresh look at the sin within And to realize that that sin will destroy humanity. That we need to repent. That we need to have Jesus in our lives because Jesus is the only bridge that bridges us between that and holy God. It's only when we have Jesus in our lives that we can overcome these things and we can have the victory over these things. These are future things that are going to happen. And if you have not Jesus in your life, then these things could affect you and will affect you. As the world deteriorates, and we can see it through Israel and Gaza, as the world deteriorates into this inhumanity, inhumane acts, it just gets darker and darker and darker. And that's with the Holy Spirit present. But see, when God gathers up his church, and we're taken away and the Holy Spirit is lifted. There is nothing balancing that out. There's nothing, this breaks are off. And people will just take what they want, when they want it, and how they want it. And if you stand in the way, you'll be destroyed. You'll be defiled. And that's the fear of these coming last days. But if you're in Jesus Christ, you don't need to live through that because he's going to gather up his church before that. We need a shout, a warning from the rooftops. We need to give people the warning before it's too late. And we need to respond to our own sin that destroys humanity. It's a call to repentance. Be holy as I am holy, says the Lord. Let's pray. Lord and Heavenly Father, although this is a tough word this morning, May we really examine ourselves, maybe look inwardly to see how it is affecting us. And Lord, if there is a way in us that is not pleasing to you, Lord, bring it to the surface that we can repent of it, that we can ask forgiveness, and that you would cleanse us afresh. And as we gather around this table this morning, may we know the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and all that he did for us in setting us free from the burden of sin, Uh, And Lord, that we would uh, live that life that he's given us, that new life in Christ Jesus. And so bless us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.